June is here, and with nice weather, actually not so nice, here comes the latest release of Home Assistant. Today we will be looking at what's new, what's hot, some breaking changes, a lot of breaking changes, and what can you expect in this release of Home Assistant. We'll start in a couple of seconds. But as always, let's start with the warning. This video has been recorded with the beta release of Home Assistant, Beta 5. That means that the most of the functionality that you will be seeing in the June release of Home Assistant should already be in. But as always, there is a possibility that if something goes wrong, part of the functionality will be pulled out and we will not see it in this release. Also, if you yourself are interested in following beta releases, I recommend that you have a separate Home Assistant instance where you can enable all the beta release updates, so you can test yourself the beta release against your integrations, and if there are any issues during the beta cycle, you can report them and get them fixed before the official release. And no, this video is not a spoiler, because all of this information is publicly available. You can follow it on the RC version of the website of Home Assistant, go to the beta channel in the Discord, or just browse the GitHub repository, and you will find all the updates and information also there. So let's get cracking with the new release. When you install the June release of Home Assistant, you will be probably greeted with something like this, because there are some breaking changes. But we'll be talking about breaking changes and how you can fix them later down the road. First, let's look at one nice new addition, especially for all of you that have some kind of a network attached storage, such as myself with Synologies, QNAPs, TrueNASes, and all the other options available on the market. If we go to System, Storage, you may see something new here, and this is the Network Storage option. Network Storage option allows you to attach external resources to your home assistant and make them available to your home. There are currently three options for the network storage. This is the backup, media, and the third one is share. Setting up of a network storage is pretty easy. All you have to do, of course, if you have network attached storage, this can be either NFS or Samba. Click on add network storage, give it a name, backup, select usage for what this will be used, for example, if you select backup, it means that from now on your system will push all the backups from Home Assistant to that network drive. This is the primary option. If you select media, this network storage will be then available in the media tab. And if you use share, you can use it for whatever you want to use to exchange files between the network attached storage and your Home Assistant. I will be selecting here backup typing the IP or the fully qualified domain name. You have to select either Samba or Network File Storage. Most of my shares are Samba shares. And then if you are using Samba, you need to specify three additional fields. Remote Share, this is the name of the folder on your NAS. Username used to access the NAS and the password for that same account. If everything is correct, when you click on connect, it should hook up your home assistant to this network attached storage or drive. If there is an error, you will get the information about the error right here. If you click on it, you can delete it or update it, or of course press cancel. From now on, for the backup, if you go to settings, system, backups, you have option to change default backup location. The default backup location can be either your local use data disk for backup or this network attached storage. If you've hooked up your media folder inside local media, media folder, you will have access to the folders that are available on your network drives. The previous release of Home Assistant brought us update to the light entity card. This has now been also updated. If I click on Zeta ceiling, I can see the new interface of the light entity card. We now have information how long ago was the state of the light changed, both in terms of when it actually happened or how many hours a minute ago. Then we have option to add our favorite colors. Click on three dots, edit favorite colors. And yes, we now also have drag and drop. 
I don't know if this is the first official drag and drop in Home Assistant or not, but you can drag, drop, delete, or add new colors. Since this is just a warm light, normal light, or cold light light bulb, I do not have all the RGB lights here. But you get the point. You select the color you want to have on your shortcuts, click on save, and then just arrange them the way you prefer them to have. While I do like the changes to the light entity card, I think that once again it is becoming too crowded. I really wish there was a way to tweak all of this and, for example, remove those if you do not really care about them. You all know the integrations page and some integrations that have issues. For example, SwitchBot, there are a lot of devices here, PowerCall has a ton of devices here, and it's really sometimes hard to scroll through all of this and select the ones that you like. But there is also one additional thing, and that is rendering. If, for example, any integration has issues, and somehow currently my system doesn't have a single issue, you will see that this box gets larger and smaller, depending if there is an error, if it's retrying, or whatever state it is. And it messes up the view of the integrations page. While, on the other hand, I really did get accustomed to this type of the integrations page. But say goodbye to the old integrations page, and let's welcome the new integrations page. As you can see, each and every box of the integration is now the same size. If there are more entities, more devices, or more whatever, those are available if you click on them. If it's retrying setup, you have notification border around it, but it stays the same size. At a glance, you can still see if the integration is using cloud services, if this is a custom component, or if this is a custom component using cloud services. But that's not all. If we click on eight devices, as previously, we will see each of those devices listed here. And we can go into details and browse the information about each of the devices inside the specific integration. But we now also have Cogwheel. If we click on this Cog, it will give you information about devices, entities, documentation, issues, or enable debugging level. Then you will have information about newly discovered devices that still haven't been added, the integrations that need attention, and yes, all the other integration entities that you already have. But visual changes are not everything that's new in a Home Assistant. If, for example, I select uh, automation, see something that I like, I can copy it, add trigger, and paste the state. It can copy and paste everything from one automation to the other automation, which is really neat function. And yes, you can use it both in your automations and scripts. It should make editing or copying data from one automation to the other automation or from one script to the other script easy. There is additional functionality that I cannot show in my system because I don't use a single blueprint. But I know that people had issues with blueprint, for example, if they have too much blueprints, they don't know which one they can delete. From now on, you have ability in the settings, automations, blueprints, to see information if this blueprint is used or not. And also, if it is already used, you will not be able to delete it before you, of course, remove the automation that is using that blueprint. One additional under the hood change is Python 3.11. But this may not have any impact on you, except in terms of speed. This release should bring additional speed improvements. And also, it is using newer SQL Lite database that should bring additional improvements beyond the Python 3.11. Well, actually, this is tied to the update with 3.11, and you will definitely see a lot more improvements in terms of speed in the future releases. We now have three new entities, date, time, and date time. Yes, we already have sensors, but we didn't have entities. These entities at this point may not be used for that much, but expect them to be used in future in custom integrations, if, for example, some devices have those fields, but we were not able to use them inside Home Assistant. Plus, of course, there are a bunch of other noteworthy changes. For example, when using services in the UI, only options and settings available to that selected target device or entity will be shown. So you will not receive a huge list of all the things that that device even doesn't support. Roborock integration has been once again approved. 
Android TV Remote now includes media player entities too. KNX provides its own panel. Bitdraco has once again improved on with, and you can now disable webhooks if, for example, you need to do that. And of course, a lot, lot more. For the new integrations, we have Airzone Cloud. We already mentioned date, time, and data slash time. Electra Smart, Google A Conversation, JVC Projector, and YouTube. I did previously release a video on the YouTube integration, but that integration was actually HACS component that you can install. This time we have internal YouTube integration. And if anyone will need help with that, I can create a separate video on it. Why would you use that? Because then you can receive notifications if the creator you are following has released new video or not. And by the way, when we are all talking about YouTube, don't forget to click the like button and also subscribe if you still haven't subscribed. And you can of course check out this video up here. That is my previous video on YouTube integration on how you can get notified if your creator creates a new video, releases it, goes live, etc. There are three new integrations available in the UI and there are a ton of breaking changes. As always, before you update, check through all of them. For example, we already mentioned Python 3.11. APC has split sensor days, so it's not seven days as an entity value, but instead it's seven with the unit days. Counter no longer restores previously manually set configuration, deprecated service called counter configure. For easy whiz, upgrade available binary sensor has been removed and replaced with a new update entity. ABM Watson integration is no longer available due to issues in the original repositories. Check out if you are still using last reset topic because it will fail. Persistent notifications are no longer stored in a state machine. But that's not all. Something that is missing from the documentation here is changes to the command line YAML configuration. It has moved. If you are using command line in your home assistant, you need to tweak your configuration. Sensors, binary sensors, covers, everything that can be configured via the command line has changed. And we now have to use the following format. We have command line, binary sensor, then the command. Or command line, cover, and command like this. Or command line, notify, and this type of the command. Everything is nicely documented in the command line section of the documentation for Home Assistant. And if you have issues converting your command line previous configuration to the new configuration, you always have option to go to Discord server or to the community forum and ask for help there. Yes, this new release is once again feature packed with all the stuff under the hood, but also nice improvements to the UI and the way we use our home assistant. I really would like to hear your opinion. What is the best or what is the worst change in this June release of Home Assistant? One of the best things for me in this release is the improvements to the integrations page, which makes it a bit more easier to read. But of course, on the first place for me is the ability to connect network storage, because I do have a lot of NAS devices with shared folders. And as a last note, I really would like to thank all those wonderful people that are supporting me and that have become YouTube channel members. Thank you all for all of your support. But let's not forget each and every one of you who has watched, liked or subscribed to my channel. If you too want to support the YouTube channel, you can do so by clicking the join button down below and becoming a YouTube channel member for only 2 euros or 2 dollars per month. Or go to my merchandise store and buy something there. I will be seeing you next time. Until then, bye bye and have fun.